It's 10 o'clock. I think we'll get started. So good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Mary Collier. I'm the Professional Development Program Manager at the Ontario Museum Association. And I'm very happy to welcome you today to Caring for Heritage Collections during the COVID-19 pandemic. So I want to start off by acknowledging that Toronto, where the only offices are located, has been the site of human activity for more than 15,000 years. Um, the land is the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Haudenosaunee and Huron Wendat. And today, Toronto is home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work in um, this community on this territory. So thank you, everybody, for being here this morning. Um, I hope that you're all well and in good spirits today. Um, this is the first of what we hope will be a series of uh, uh, a regular series of webinars with uh, some helpful information to get you and your organization through closures and uh, social distancing. Um, so I just want to make sure that we uh, make sure that everybody knows how to participate today. Um, so you'll see the slides on the screen as you can right now. Go to my next one. Um, if you'd like to ask a question or make a comment to the presenter, um, simply type your message into the Q&A box that you can access at the bottom of your screen. Um, so my colleague Christopher Shackleton is logged in as the Ontario Museum Association and he um, is on hand to um, help out and moderate as well. So we'll be monitoring the Q&A throughout the webinar today um, and we'll do our best to ensure that all of your questions are answered during the Q&A portion. Um, but we do have a lot of people, so we'll we'll do our best um, in the time that we have. Um, and I want to also mention that we are recording today and the recording will be made available after the event. So today's uh, webinar will be one hour. So we'll begin uh, with a bit of an introduction and then I'll pass it over to Irene, our presenter. There'll be about 15 or 20 minutes for questions after the presentation. And I'll make some quick announcements and we'll wrap up at um, 11. So I am very happy to introduce our presenter today, Irene Kirsten. Um, Irene is a Senior Preservation Development Advisor at the Canadian Conservation Institute. Um, she's advised heritage institutions on preventive conservation, care of collections, um, emergency preparedness and facilities upgrades, in addition to managing um, collections risk assessment projects um, since 2009. Um, so I'll just got, got a note that I might need to speak up a little bit, so I'll try and do that. Um, so this is a, a very timely topic and one that the folks at CCI have been researching um, and just put out a technical bulletin yesterday, so Irene can tell you a bit more about that. Um, so we're, we're very, very grateful that Irene has made the time to come and talk with us today and uh, for being here to share. So I'd like to pass it over to Irene now to get started. So Irene, if you want to mute, unmute and share, go right ahead. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? I hope so. Yes, you're good. good. <laughs> okay, okay, we're good to go then. Well, I'm, I need to say I'm happy to be here, here with you this morning, but given the circumstances, I would rather it was not the case. Nevertheless, we are dealing with this situation and so uh, we're gonna do the best we can to uh, give you some information to help you care with, care of, take care of your collections during this strange time. Cultural heritage institutions are coping with many challenges as the world deals with the COVID-19 pandemic. While collections are not directly at risk, the pandemic complicates their care. Today, I'm going to share with you the information and recommendations compiled by the Canadian Conservation Institute to help those responsible for heritage collections. I will address questions about collections contamination, disinfection of museum spaces, and risks to collections during long-term shutdown. CCI has written a note based on these same questions that we are sharing on the internet, and you will be able to find more detail there after this webinar. Dealing with COVID-19 is new for all of us. 
At CCR, we recognize that knowledge about COVID-19 continues to evolve, which may require us to adapt our re recommendations from time to time. Meanwhile, we share what we know now to help keep people and collections safe. So you've heard about me and you'll meet me at the end of this webinar, but let's take a minute to make the key protagonists in our current situation. Oh, oh, wait a minute. I suppose you can't see it. Let me up the magnification. Uh, here we are, the COVID-19 virus. You are probably all familiar with what it looks like, but the problem is we can't see it. But we know it's out there and it's already affecting the operation of cultural heritage institutions. I want to begin by discussing direct contamination of collections materials by COVID-19. Can the COVID-19 virus be transmitted via collection objects or heritage surfaces? According to the World Health Organization, people can catch COVID-19 by touching contaminated surfaces or objects and then touching their eyes, nose, or mouth. If an infected person coughs or exhales in the direction of a collection of objects or handles objects with contaminated hands, the object materials could be contaminated with the virus, which could, in theory, be transmitted to those who handle the objects afterwards. Since collection objects tend to be handled infrequently and the virus deactivates naturally outside of the human body, the chance of tr transmission is probably low. The risks may be higher where people work in heritage interiors and use heritage furnishings. How long does the COVID-19 virus persist on surfaces? The COVID-19 virus is a membrane envelope virus with glycoprotein spikes. Its bilayer lipid membrane degrades with drying and exposure to air. Information on persistence of the COVID-19 virus is still developing with just a few studies to date. So current guidance is mostly based on research on previous human coronaviruses like SARS. The SARS virus was found to lose most infectivity by six days and all infectivity by nine days at room temperature. So this gives us a conservative estimate that may change as more testing is done on the COVID-19 virus. Persistence does vary with characteristics of the surface material and the presence of other contaminants. The virus tends to persist longer and to transfer more easily from smooth surfaces like metal and hard plastics than from porous surfaces like paper and textiles. Does the environment affect how long the coronavirus persists? Studies of the COVID-19 virus and other similar coronaviruses indicates that indicate that environmental conditions such as temperature, relative humidity, pH, and the presence of UV radiation do affect how long viruses persist on a surface. The effects are often complex and what we know is based on laboratory research that may not reflect conditions in cultural heritage facilities. A few observations are possible. In general, cool temperatures, around four to six Celsius, prolong viral persistence, while very warm temperatures, 60 degrees Celsius and higher, result in rapid loss of virulence. Most of the recommendations I am sharing with you today assume normal room temperature. Greater caution is suggested if contamination occurs in cooler collection spaces, such as walk-in freezers or unheated rooms. Low relative humidity, around 20 to 30 percent, which is common in heated museum spaces that are not humidified in winter in Canada, also prolongs virulence, but may reduce surface to surface transfer. Dust raised in such dry conditions can be problematic as it re aerosolizes attached viruses. Ultraviolet radiation does appear to reduce virulence but tests of its use for disinfection have not been sufficiently successful for us to recommend it for cultural materials. Should collection objects or heritage materials be disinfected due to COVID-19? Disinfection, uh, disinfecting collection objects or heritage materials is not recommended. Disinfecting solutions contain alcohol, bleach, or other chemicals that can damage many of the surfaces and materials in heritage collections. 
Although certain solutions might be appropriate for some materials, for example, 70% ethanol on metal surfaces, inappropriate use can cause permanent damage or fail to disinfect properly. Always consult a professional conservator before doing any kind of treatment of this kind. Instead, we recommend object quarantine if there is a risk of transfer of virus from contaminated objects to people. Wait until the virus deactivates naturally on surfaces before handling any objects or resuming operations. And as we've said, it happens in about 69 days. Cleaning with mild detergent solutions followed by rinsing may be appropriate for heritage interior surfaces in certain situations, especially those that are not touched frequently. It could also be used for an items in an education collection, for example, that are frequently handled. But as we will see later, cleaning, although cleaning makes a difference, it is not the same as disinfecting. Should hand sanitizing products be used by people handling heritage materials? Hand washing and hand sanitizing are highly recommended for reducing the transfer of the COVID-19 virus. Washing hands with soap and water prior to handling objects and records is an accepted alternative where gloves may not be appropriate. Hand sanitizers provide an alternate way to reduce disease transmission and have been approved for general use against the COVID-19 virus by government regulators like Health Canada. Some heritage institutions may provide hand sanitizers to staff and visitors, particularly during pandemics. Hand sanitizers could leave residues on objects or records that could eventually damage some materials. In 2011, the Library of Congress conducted an exploratory study on the effects of selected hand sanitizers on paper that indicated the potential for damage, although they used test methods that differ from what would be expected during collection use. Hand washing or use of disposable gloves might be preferred for those who handle collection items directly. If you use cotton gloves, place them in a closed container after each use and launder in hot water before reuse. So, but what about disinfection of collection or heritage facilities? What if a person has been affected with COVID-19 and has been in your facility? What should you do? Well, first, follow public health guide guidelines for people who were in close contact with the infected person or who share workspaces. Next, follow public health guidelines for cleaning and disinfecting the spaces and non-heritage surfaces that were touched or accessed by the infected person. Let me repeat, we are not recommending that you disinfect heritage materials, just the non-heritage surfaces. You can begin by closing off areas that were used by the infected person and increase air circulation. Wait at least 24 hours to allow aerosols to settle, then clean and disinfect. The first step, cleaning, removes dirt as well as viral and bacterial loads on surfaces that will make disinfecting more effective. So cleaning alone provides some protection. Disinfecting usually involves the application of a solution that de deactivates any pathogens that remain after cleaning. Wear personal protective equipment to protect against the disinfectant as well as the virus. If it has been more than seven days since the infected person was in the building, further cleaning and disinfecting is not required. So if you are worried about using disinfectants in a collection space, you can quarantine the whole room for a week to nine days instead. What disinfectants are appropriate for non-heritage surfaces in collection facilities and heritage interiors? Many disinfectants can be used on non-collection services in cultural heritage facilities. If you intend to use a household or commercial product, first check that it has been approved for use against the COVID-19 virus. In Canada, you can find a list on the Health Canada website. To be effective, you will need to follow the manufacturer's guidelines for use and application. First, find a disinfectant that is compatible with the surfaces you need to disinfect. Consider, consider chemical interactions as well as contact time, which depends on the concentration and type of active ingredient. Think about both the bulk material and any surface finishes. 
it's never a bad idea to do a spot test on a very small area before moving on to an entire surface when using a new cleaner or disinfectant. Once a disinfectant has been chosen, follow all application steps. After the required contact or drying time, rinse as instructed. Health Canada requires that product labels indicate rinsing instructions as well as any information on incompatible surfaces. You can also find public health guidelines for cleaning soft surfaces, electronics, and for laundering or carpet steaming through organizations like the U.S. Senators, Centers for Disease Control, the CDC, and the World Health Organization. Remember that these guidelines have been developed to combat viruses in public spaces. They are appropriate for non-collection spaces in your institution. For example, entrance halls, ticketing booths, the cafe and offices. We need to take greater care in collection spaces and heritage interiors. So can collection workspaces, for example, be disinfected safely? Yes, it is possible to safely disinfect non-heritage surfaces tables, desks, and shelves, etc., that are used for work with collection artifacts or archival records. Heavily touched sur hard surfaces may need regular cleaning and disinfecting. Hard surfaces are the easiest surfaces to disinfect. They are also the surfaces on which the virus can persist the longest and with the highest transfer concentration to skin. Disinfecting compounds and their application methods, wet spraying, wiping, contact times, have to be appropriate for the surface to which they are applied. Test first and consider the effects of overspray or dripping on any nearby collection items or heritage surfaces. Cleaning and disinfecting should leave no potentially harmful residues on surfaces, such as reading room tables or shelves for storing artifacts. Um, residues that could come in con direct contact with collection items. Although commercial products can be used, the effects of additives, things like colorants, scents, foaming agents, etc., may be problematic. Make sure to follow any rinsing instructions, which is usually a clean water wipe down after the required contact time. The easiest way to avoid residues is to use simple solutions that you can prepare in house. What disinfectants are appropriate for such surfaces? Dilute household bleach is one option. Di household bleach is usually sold as 5 to 10% by weight sodium hypochlorite. For disinfecting against COVID-19, you will need a solution of at least 0.1% sodium hy hypochlorite applied for one minute. That's 20 milliliters of bleach per liter of water or 5 milliliters per cup. Dilute solutions with concentrations of 0.5 to 1% may be considered in situations where contact times need to be shorter, for example, 30 seconds. Avoid using concentrated bleach solutions. They will leave sodium chloride residues on the surface that can damage some materials such as metals. Bleach use also requires good ventilation, protective gloves and eyewear, and should never be mixed with other disinfectants or cleaners. Alcohol water solutions are another option, as long as the alcohol concentration is above 70% by volume. Either ethyl alcohol, ethanol, or isopropyl alcohol, rubbing alcohol, for example, can be used. The strength of rubbing alcohol sold at pharmacies is usually either 70% or 90%. If you have 90% rubbing alcohol, you can dilute it further in water to extend its use. You may be able to get high proof ethanol, um, also called grain alcohol, from some liquor stores. It needs to be at least 140 proof to be effective. Be cautious of the denatured alcohol that is sold at hardware stores. The denaturing elements, for example, methanol or methyl ethyl ketone, can be more harmful to human health than ethanol alone. Contact times of 30 seconds appear to be effective against coronatype viruses. Alcohols have been recommended for cleaning electronic surfaces by the CDC. Caution is necessary if you need to disinfect acrylic or plexiglass surfaces, however, as cracking can result. Use of alcohols should be avoided on finished wood surfaces since many finishes are sensitive to alcohol. 
Can we use the same protocols as for mold infested collections? No. Viruses have their own properties of resistance to disinfectant chemicals. But that said, similar or identically formulated disinfectants, like the Hauzo bleach solutions, can have strong efficacy against both mold and viruses. What if your institution wants to use electrostatic disinfectant sprayers in all spaces, including collection rooms? Is this appropriate? Electric st electrostatic spray technology is one method of applying approved disinfectant solutions. The technology is being adopted as a more efficient application method, particularly over complex surfaces. There seems to be little research comparing its efficacy relative to other methods of disinfection, however. Since the key component is the disinfectant, there is no reason to think that it doesn't work. However, the method may permit less control over where the disinfectant is applied than manual application. Since heritage objects and surfaces could be sprayed inadvertently with disinfectant, the use of this application technique in collection spaces or heritage interiors is not recommended. Should we remove heritage objects like artworks or furniture from rooms that need to be disinfected? Removal of cultural heritage objects from spaces due to COVID-19 concerns is not recommended in most cases. Handling and transport of collection objects brings its own risks, and the objects themselves could potentially be contaminated. Collection staff could be put at risk of infection. In heritage interiors, certain components will not be able to be moved at all. Isolation of spaces with collection objects or heritage finishes for a week to nine days, followed by thorough regular cleaning, is the preferred method of controlling viral spread. If faster access is required, Isolate the room for 24 hours to allow aerosols to settle, then clean and disinfect high touch non heritage surfaces using application methods that can be well controlled. Daily cleaning of heritage finishes that are likely to be touched, such as handrails and doorknobs, is also suggested. Instruct cleaners to take care when working around heritage materials and consult a conservator before disinfecting um, around heritage, heritage materials. Let's move to just dealing with closure and reopening. How do we ensure that collections remain safe when your institution is closed indefinitely with few or no staff regularly on site? Much preventive conservation care of collections depends on the regular presence of collections, security, and facility staff. When this presence is disrupted, some risks to collections may increase while others may decrease. So what can you do? First, maintain security. Good security is vital during any long-term closure. Criminals may take advantage of reduced staff presence on site. The economic downturn may motivate criminal behavior. Ensure that security protocols and monitoring systems are maintained. So secure the building by making sure that all doors and windows are properly closed and locked and that intrusion detection and fire protection systems are working properly. Secure valuables not only collection items, but cash boxes, computer screens, laptops, and other electronic equipment that may be attractive for thieves. Secure important documents. Ensure that desks and offices are left tidy and that all sensitive documents and inf information is put away. Of course, secure the collection. Identify any artifacts that may be vulnerable to theft in galleries or workspaces and consider returning them to storage if that is more secure. Maintain a presence through regular site and perimeter checks daily if possible to identify problems and initiate corrective action quickly. Demonstrate that the building is being monitored by maintaining walkways and landscaping if possible. And document all entry into the facility. Turn off or block light. This is what we do every day when we close out. Review whether your normal procedures are sufficient in this context. Block all light in collection spaces, except what is needed for security purposes. Manage the environment. Decreasing the air exchange rate when few or no people are on site could provide a more stable, less dusty environment in collection spaces. However, increased outdoor air ventilation and less use or higher filtration of recirculated air 
is suggested by HVAC engineering associations for workspaces if staff are present regularly. In newer buildings, HVAC systems can probably be monitored and adjusted remotely. If portable equipment such as humidifiers is used to maintain environmental conditions, provide ongoing maintenance or cons consider shutting it down, particularly if it is prone to malfunction or leaks. Consider dropping the temperature set point a few degrees if this can be done without increasing the risk of mold. Lower temperature slows degradation rates reduces pest activity and saves on heating costs, but ensure that adequate ventilation or air movement is provided if mold is a concern. Reduce pest risks. Pests could be problematic, especially where chronic problems are no longer being monitored closely. Remove food from gift shops, cafes, and offices unless stored in reliable refrigeration or freezer units to curb rodents. Remove all food waste and garbage to outside receptacles. If possible, replace sticky traps prior to closing and monthly thereafter, if site inspections are possible. Doing so will permit monitoring of insect activity during closure, but also removes dead insects that can attract certain museum pests. Since infestations are common in spring, plan for response in advance. Inspect and maintain the building. Review building maintenance tasks and ensure that essential projects are completed. In addition to checking the site and building perimeter, conduct regular inspections inside the building if possible, paying particular attention to areas of concern such as locations prone to leaks. And you may particularly do this after there's a heavy rainfall. A checklist is recommended to guide such inspections. If non-collection staff are responsible for inspections, provide virtual collections care training, highlighting key issues that they should look for, or set up a system for remote reporting and consulting. What if your institution has another emergency, such as a fire or flood that damages the collection while you are closed? What should you do? As at any time, quick response to emergencies can limit damage to collections and enhance recovery. Response will be more challenging during the COVID-19 pandemic. Local reg regulations may prevent gatherings of the number of people needed to respond quickly and effectively. Staff may be ill, self-isolating, or laid off. Personal protective equipment required for responders may have been donated to local hospitals. Certain measures can be taken to reduce the likelihood or negative consequences of another kind of emergency. Regular inspections will help detect other emergencies early. Turn off and unplug non-essential electrical equipment. Cover collections with plastic sheeting in areas prone to leaks. Drain plumbing if there is a risk of freezing. For institutions in areas prone to spring flooding, we suggest moving collections potentially at risk to higher ground. We encourage institutions to review and update emergency plans and discuss uh, options for response by teleconference, email or chat using a simple tabletop exercise. Basic training may be essential if you need to bring new people into your emergency response team. If your plan depends on securing materials and equipment as needed or on the services of external contractors, Check to see if these will still be available. Contact your insurance company to see how closure might affect your coverage. And document your response to the pandemic, as this could be useful should a similar situation occur in the future. In the event that an emergency does occur, implement response as best you can. Inform local authorities of the need to respond and request guidelines for safe working conditions. Use methods to buy time, such as freezing wet materials whenever possible. Take particular care of responders, since high stress and fatigue can increase chance of infection. Canadian institutions are encouraged to contact the Canadian Conservation Institute for expert advice. So now, when it comes to reopening, do you need to clean and disinfect the building? 
Given public anxieties and the possible resurgence of the virus, establishing good cleaning and dis disinfecting protocol is prudent on reopening, even if persistence of the virus in the building is unlikely due to closure. Follow public health guidelines for cleaning public spaces. Normal cleaning procedures combined with disinfecting of high touch non-heritage surfaces should be sufficient for lower traffic collection spaces. If the building has been closed for some time with no interior inspections, plan for extra time before reopening to the public to do thorough inspections and cleaning, as well as any needed repairs and to deal with pest or mold if infestations, if present. What is an appropriate protocol for receiving incoming collection items once you reopen? During institutional closure, delaying returns and extending loans will minimize risk to artifacts and people alike. Even after reopening, isolating incoming materials like library books, artifact loans, natural history specimens, or new acquisitions is a prudent protective measure in order to give time for any possible viral contamination to naturally degrade. Application of any chemical disinfectant or sanitizer on collection material is not recommended. As mentioned earlier, isolation for a week to nine days is a conservative suggestion for items at normal room temperature. Managing the incoming material requires a temporary isolation room or at least a sectioned off space, depending on the amount of space you have available. Receive the incoming materials while wearing personal protective equipment, gloves at the very least, and develop a method for tracking when items go into isolation and when they are ready to be moved out. Depending on space constraints and receiving equipment requirements, materials may be unpacked before isolation or left as received. Bear in mind that less unpacking and therefore less handling minimizes staff exposure. Either safely discard unwanted packing materials or store packing materials for their own isolation period before reuse. Hard surface containers made out of plastic could be cleaned and disinfected. Care for human health at each stage. Should your experience with the COVID-19 pandemic change how you manage collection objects and records that are regularly handled by clients and staff? During a pandemic, transmission of infection could be linked to use of library, archival, study and education collections. Much of such collection use has probably been suspended at present, but the risk of resurgence may remain when institutions reopen for normal business. It may be prudent to modify protocol to incorporate an isolation period between each use of a collection item as a temporary measure. How would this work? After each use, isolate the item for an appropriate period of time is in a designated zone and post quarantine notification. When space for quarantine is not available, you could return materials to their permanent storage lo location, but consider bagging it if the material will be in direct contact with other items, such as in archival or library collections. Where possible, identify isolated items in collection databases and indicate the isolation period. Create labels that will accompany the items to storage. Labels should include, at minimum, the object's unique identifier, the standard quarantine statement, as well as the start and end dates of the isolation period. The labels should be prominent and visible to all staff. Clean and disinfect carts each time they are used to transport potentially contaminated material. Follow conscientious hand hygiene protocol or use gloves. Clean and disinfect the quarantine space before using it for other purposes. And you can incorporate new or updated procedures into collections management and emergency plans and procedures. Digitization can provide safe access to certain kinds of collection items and information during a pandemic. The experience of the COVID-19 pandemic could inform digitization strategies in order to make more materials accessible while minimizing health risks to staff and visitors. I will end with a summary of the key points that we need to remember while we deal with COVID-19. First, protect people. Follow the advice of your local public health authorities, including practicing physical distancing, 
If you have not already done so, seriously consider closing your institution, even if it is not required. When you do reopen, follow the advice of public health authorities to establish what activities are appropriate and how to protect staff and visitors, particularly as long as resurgence is a possibility. Use isolation to prevent or deal with contamination of collection spaces and objects whenever possible. The virus will deactivate naturally within six to nine days. Disinfecting solutions, on the other hand, will damage many heritage materials. If disinfection of non-heritage surfaces in collection spaces is required, use methods that permit controlled application of cleaning solutions and disinfectants and only for non-heritage surfaces. Always use disinfectants that have been approved by public health authorities. If your institution needs to close indefinitely, do so in a manner that provides adequate security, fire protection, pest management, and environmental control. Implement regular inspections of the exterior and if possible, the interior, including collection spaces. Consider in advance how you would respond if needed to other kinds of emergencies, such as water leaks or fires. CCI has prepared a note that includes all that I have presented here, plus more detail on certain topics, like the effects of the environment on COVID-19 persistence and the types of disinfectants. We have partnered with the Canadian Association for Conservation of Cultural Property to share this material quickly. You can find this note in both English and French on the CAC website. Developing the content for this webinar and the related technical note was a group effort. I would like to acknowledge the contributions of the CCI COVID-19 Task Force, which includes, in addition to myself, Simon Lambert, Tom Strang, Crystal Maitland, Janet Kepkevich, as well as Roger Baird and Evelyn Ayer. And of course, we have consulted all the materials that other organizations have made available on the webs in the web, and we've given links to such materials in our technical note. I hope that we've been able to address your questions about caring for cultural heritage collections during the COVID-19 pandemic. We have some time now for some more of your questions, but also feel free to contact me at CCI. You can use the emailed address given here because right now we are unable to monitor the general CCI services email at this time. It's unfortunately just not considered a, an essential service. Um, this pandemic situation continues to evolve. We are here to work with you to figure out how best to keep collections safe over the com coming months. Thank you very much. Great. Well, thank you very much, Irene. Um, there we are. Hey, there you are. <laughs> and there I am as well. Okay, <laughs> I'll try and, uh, and, and speak up now. I think I was a little bit quiet before, but we have uh, had some questions come in um, while you're talking. Um, so some of them are a bit long, but I'll, I'll try and get the gist across. So first of all, one question is how do we judge if objects are potentially contaminated, our collections will be consulted only by internal staff and on-site researchers once we return to our institution. Do we assume that any object that has been consulted internally is potentially contaminated and should be quarantined for nine days before it's consulted again, even if staff um, don't show symptoms or is known to have been in contact with an infected person? Or do we simply act with caution, wearing gloves to handle collections and making sure we don't touch, us our, touch our faces for the foreseeable future? Of course, the problem is we can't see this virus, so we don't know. <laughs> and there's no, nobody's bothered figuring out a way of testing surfaces because they're concentrating on the right thing, which is figuring out whether people are infected. And that's the testing we really need right now. Um, I would say, uh, I mean, there's different approaches to this. The prudent approach would be to be suspicious of all materials, but seriously, if the staff working in the institution have not been ill and there's no evidence that they've been exposed, um, there's no risk. Um, they're not gonna transmit any viral material onto the objects. Uh, and even if they, if they, and if they have been ill and it's been several weeks, it's not there anymore. 
So I would say if you see no evidence of people getting sick while they're working in collection spaces, um, you don't have to worry about it. Uh, but if you want to be very, very prudent, uh, I mean, it's a balancing act between keeping your operations going to some extent and um, making sure that people don't get, get ill. I, there's not, um, it, it's clear that people can get this disease from touching surfaces, but I think all the people in public health are still saying the primary method of transmission is directly from other people. So this is, and, or from high touch surfaces. And I would say most collection materials are not high touch surfaces. So I, I think there's different ways of looking at it. There's not one right answer here, but I don't think we want to get too, um, ah, the one exception I would say is when you don't have total control of your materials all the time. So I'm thinking public lending libraries, if the material goes outside of the building and you have no clue what's going on outside there, I, I think being more prudent is the right thing to do when that material comes back because you don't know what it was exposed to. But if it's within your spaces and you have had control over how the, the materials are being used and there's no evidence of illness amongst the people using the materials, I don't think you need to become too paranoid about it. All right, thank you. <clears throat> so our next question, um, Francesca says, unfortunately, we have to use toxic compounds for cleaning. So other issues in terms of waste and aerosol and um, volatile organic compounds. So how do we deal with the problem of environmental impact and sustainability? Um, uh, is the question, um, I mean, first of all, I would say limit the use of the chemicals to only where they need to be used and find a way to use them that um, limits where they go, particularly in collection spaces. Uh, ultimately, we're all responsible for help doing our part to keep this uh, illness from spreading so that our, our whole societies can get back to normal. And there are only certain chemicals that are available that will kill this virus. So, but the alternative is to close up spaces and keep people out of them. So that's an alternative. And that's why perhaps shutting down your institution almost completely is a way to both protect collections, but also to protect people. And it's a way to do it without the use of nasty chemicals. I'm not sure if that directly answers the question, but uh, yeah. I think it depends on what you're doing within the institution, what the answer is gonna be. Okay, um, so next uh, a question about pests. So monitoring for pests is one thing, but mitigating for an outbreak is another. Yeah. Cluster flies, flying ants and ladybugs are, are blooming around this time. Are there any suggested mitigation tactics other than sticky traps? First, sticky, tap, sticky traps is not mitigation. Sticky traps is about detection. It's about finding out that you have a problem. Um, so mitigation, for mitigation, you're going to need to allow people to go in, into the spaces, uh, and deal with where the problem is. Uh, I have heard people talk about, for example, watch drains. If drains are left to go dry, you can have problems with flies. So going in and pouring, flushing the drains and pouring water down your drains in the floors, for example, may just prevent such a problem. Um, if you are, if you have identified an outbreak, you have to do what you usually do when there's an outbreak, which is to go in, inspect collections more carefully, find out the extent of the outbreak, um, and then isolate that material. Uh, again, in this case, you know, freezing methods is a method often to used to treat materials. If you can freeze things, if you're ready to do that, it can, they can be put in the freezer and left indefinitely until you have time to pull them out. Um, that's why I say there's a lot of, uh, what you exactly do depends on your context. So I would just look at your, your in integrated pest management plans. I'm hoping you've already figured out what you have to do in normal cir circumstances. Start from that and then figure out what are the constraints when it comes to access to the site and social distancing? But certainly being able to catch those infestations sooner would make the response easier because it would, the infestation will be less widespread. So if you can have access just for those inspections, I highly recommend it. Okay. 
Um, so we have a question from someone who has actually experienced what you were talking about in terms of a second disaster on top oh. of COVID-19. So um, curator from the Croatian History Museum in Zagreb where they experienced a, an earthquake on the 21st right. of March. So they are um, preparing evacuation of museum objects. And so the question is, do you have any suggestions or guidelines on how to organize evacuation teams as to obey the social distance guidelines to protect people and also to protect the museum objects from being infected? Okay. <laughs> I always hope this never comes up, <laughs> but I heard about the earthquake and that's uh, I'm very sorry to hear about the earthquakes. Uh, not what you want, particularly at this point in time. I think, I think figuring out an evacuation routine that respects social distancing is possible um, first by planning how you're going to do it without going, like to the extent, you, you can do inspections on site with a handful of people. Then plan where is stuff going to go, how is it going to be packaged, how is it going to be moved, etc. off site and set it up in a way that one, you, you, you've got people who are either well-trained or you can count on to handle things appropriately and such that you can send people in and keep their, the proper social distance as they pick things up and move things. There may be small numbers of things that are too heavy and half, you need more than one person to deal with them. In that case, I would look at, can you protect those pieces in place, like not move them for now? It, it, that's going to depend on the, the condition of the building in the in the area where those materials are located. Um, or in those cases, you may need to have your staff well um, with personal protective equipment that protects them from each other as well as from the, the space itself. Uh, again, if you're working with people who are not ill, the chance of contamination and, and spreading illness is if you keep social distancing, and I would suggest wearing of masks while you do this, it's probably good for many reasons, but I would certainly do it in this, under this circumstance. Um, you can mitigate it relatively well, but whenever possible, just keeping people apart and doing the planning from a distance, uh, you know, over a, a conference call like this to figure out how you're going to proceed. Um, yeah, it's, it's not going to be, I admit, it's not going to be easy. And that's, that's the one that scares me, uh, is when you're in that situation, at least, uh, in your case. And what I don't know is, is are the, are there problems in the buildings? Cause I know some of the buildings, there was some structural damage and there was loss of roof, etc. Is there, is there a, a big concern within the buildings of, uh, water damage from rain, etc. That's going to, push the urgency to move things out. It, otherwise, if it's just physical damage and things are otherwise protected, you have time to do it more slowly. And you can take care and if, and then if people start getting sick, slow it down, you know, take the time you need. But if there's urgency because there could be water damage, either cover things up or figure out a way that you can do it more quickly. It's uh, easy to me, for me to say, you guys have to figure it out, but you can contact me if you want to discuss possibilities and we can discuss it. But I have to say, I have not been in your situation and nobody's been in this situation. So we're going to have to figure it out as we go along. All right, thank you. Um, so we have a question about um, returning library books. So for returning library books in a library, do we separate the books we put in quarantine in the quarantine space. So I think that means separate the books from each other, I'm assuming. Oh, I don't, uh, that's a good question. <laughs> you can see, I haven't even thought of some of these things. It's just as you, as you say the question a different way, then I say, oh, okay, okay. Um, because my first thought would be, I think if thing, things are, I'm assuming this is a lending library, things are coming back from wherever. So things will come back at a, at a certain rate. So one day's worth of books come back. I don't see there's any reason that you need to separate a whole day's worth of returns. You can put them on carts and label the cart. This came in this day and, and put it somewhere or put them on a shelf together. Um, but obviously, if you're doing it for a certain isolation period, you probably don't want to have new stuff coming in side by side with old stuff that's been there for almost a week. Whether I mean, the chance of cross contamination surface to surface, that's a good question. I haven't seen I don't think we've seen any information on that, 
because everybody's focusing on does it transfer to people they're not focusing on does it transfer to another so would a, a viral virally contaminated book would it transfer to a book beside it nobody's looking at that so we can't say for sure so i think it would be prudent to separate bunches that come in at the same time but i don't think there's any need to separate multiple items that come in at the same time but separate them from stuff that's coming in later so that you can maintain your isolation periods and and don't have there's no chance of cross-contamination um, regardless okay thank you um so the next question um just is as the the situation and medical knowledge of the virus seems to be constantly evolving will cci be updating their note over the coming months or <laughs> offering more q a sessions such as this it is our plan to update the note if we need to. And in fact, some of the material that um, I, gave, I gave to you today on HVAC, air recirculation, et cetera, that came up just at the last minute in response to somebody's question. And it's not currently in the note. And I'm already gonna go to our team and say, uh, we gotta start planning for the next revision because there's new, it's not just, it's other organizations that are coming up with very useful information for people in our organization, our, in our sector. Um, so as that material uh, appears, we can interpret it from our collections care per perspective and we will um, get that out for people. How often we do that, um, I have to talk to our team about that. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, so speaking of HVAC, um, what are CCI's recommendations for changing HVAC filters in shared office spaces or storage or gallery spaces? Talk to your HVAC people. <laughs> this is a HVAC filter question. I don't have the expertise to say that. Um, I have read a little bit in the last couple of days that suggests that if what the filters are filtering is outdoor air, uh, the risk is pretty small because that's not where the the virus is or not in a great enough concentration to worry it's from indoor spaces so you have to look at where the filters are and your hvac people if they're not sure they should consult the information that is available from there's uh, both ashray which is the big organization of uh, air conditioning and heating and ventilation engineers has a note that's out on the internet and there's a european group that has a note uh, I, unfortunately, it's not in our technical note right now, but those are uh, links that we hope to get out to everybody shortly. So, but you've got to talk to the expert on, on HVAC filtration on that. Okay. Um, so one, one question that actually had come in um, prior to the webinar was about the kind of differing opinions of six to nine days versus 72 hours for isolation. Um, could you just speak to that briefly? Sure. Yeah, I'm sure all of you have seen lots of different numbers out there on how long the virus lasts on different types of materials like paper versus wood versus metal, etc. When we were looking at all the information, we decided to stay conservative and to consider that in many, for many of our clients, we're looking at mixed collections, all kinds of materials, and therefore to just give the conservative estimate that research has shown um, that we can be quite certain that the virus will no longer be active. But it's clear from the research too that it starts becoming less virulent immediately over time when it's outside of the human body. So any delay is going to make it less likely to cause infection. Um, what we suggest is, I'm not going to comment on other times, but what we suggest is listen to, we will be monitoring what the public health authorities are saying. Health Canada, for example, still says on its website, we don't know how long it lasts. Um, so we're gonna be continuing to monitor that. And as better information becomes available on this virus, uh, the COVID-19 virus, we will update our recommendations because certainly um, a shorter period of uh, isolation. And we have seen, for example, for, the, for libraries where sometimes 24 to 72 hours has been suggested. Um, that would make your operations much easier if you're if you're implementing a temporary isolation between use uh, protocol. Uh, but at this point, we're being conservative. Uh, we're taking you based on the best information that was available at the time we put the note together. So that's why there's a difference. Okay. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. 
So um, another question. So if visitors like to touch specific objects, um, such as textiles and paintings with or without glass protection, when the museum reopens and keeps regular hours, um, how do we reduce the risk of transfer from contaminated objects to people? Um, if we don't have the possibility to isolate the objects or move them from the exhibition for the seven to nine days. Um, that's, a, that's a very good question. In fact, it makes me think of historic house museums where to some extent, a uh, certain amount of stuff anyway, some, some stuff may be roped off, but other stuff is just right there and, and people do touch, uh, regardless of how much we tell people not to touch. But maybe, maybe just maybe this disease will make people less likely to touch things. If we can tell people that there's a slight chance of transmission, um, it's possible that touching will just become uh, the visitors will be less likely to touch initially on reopening. Uh, and as, as long as uh, once the illness becomes better controlled, such as once we have a vaccine and we can vaccinate against it, uh, um, we can probably move, but, but this you gotta, you gotta listen to the public health authorities. It's clear though they're saying this is not the primary method of transmission. So um, it's going to come down to what is the chance. And I think at that point, not right now, but at that point, we can consider the fact that we have these kind of illnesses with us all the time. And we haven't worried too much about people with the flu touching things and transmitting it. And I think it's for two reasons. One, the chance is relatively low. And two, we, we have better means of being able to treat people who get ill. But there's, there's no evidence from influenza transfer because of museums. The question is, is COVID-19 going to be different? We have to wait and find out. Um, and we just may, you may need to tell everybody much more seriously. I mean, most places have their do not touch signs, but we may need to have a, a better uh, instruction as people arrive about that slight risk to make them a little bit more paranoid so that they don't touch anything. But I think we, I don't think we should start to worry that suddenly we're going to have a whole bunch of sick people because they touch gently one piece part of, I mean, the chance of somebody else touching and transfer actually happening at that same place. I would look at high touch surfaces though. So say in a historic house museum, door uh, frames, uh, places where people might lean, places where people, uh, or, or if you have barriers, saw, into at the at, in the doorways that people might hold on to those kind of places are places that are high touch and could potentially see transfer particular if they're smooth so have good ways of cleaning those and if it's a material if it's original material you don't want to disinfect then clean very frequently to bring the risk down or talk to your public health authorities and say what should we do or talk to a conservator and together they may be able to help you come up with a disinfecting routine that's safe for that particular material. Okay, thank you. We have quite a few more questions, but unfortunately we are coming to the end of our time, but <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I do want to say that I will take all of the questions that have been submitted, pass them on to Irene and the team at CCI. And so perhaps some of those questions can inform the next iteration of, of the technical note. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, well, they will for sure. Um, to the, but to the extent that it, if it's something particular to your situation, because our technical notes obviously are, are relatively general, um, as I mentioned, I, I, I hope you saw my email address. Feel free to email me directly. I will pass it on to the best person at, um, at uh, CCI uh, who can answer your question if it's not uh, a member of our group. Of course, we have experts in all areas. Uh, Mary, do you want me to put up the screen with my email address? there for a minute? Sure, yeah, go right yeah, ahead. Here, let me just put this, uh, oh, where did it go? See if I can pull this up. Here we are. There you are, irene.karsten at canada.ca. Um, so feel free to contact us directly um, and uh, we'll do the best to, to answer your particular questions. But do understand, I mean, we're all in this together. It's new stuff, we're, we're figuring it out. Um, as we go along. 
And, uh, uh, but that's the way, by hearing your questions, that's the way we figure out uh, how to do it. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Irene. Um, I get my slide back on there. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. It's it's as you say. It's it's a uh, it's a moving target, and we really appreciate that the team at CCI has been working so hard um, to to put together some really useful um, and practical information for people. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, for for everything that that the whole team at CCI is doing, um, we're really fortunate to have to have such rigorous uh, rigorous research, and also that's in a way that it's accessible. To those of us who are not perhaps con conservators and scientists. Um, so, but thank you so much for for uh, presenting today. Um, yeah, and, and can I? Uh, I'd like to thank the Ontario Museums Association for giving us this opportunity to share our materials in this fashion. So, thank you very much. Yes, our pleasure. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, before we we sign off today, I just wanted to a few announcements about sort of what's next. Um, thank you all for coming today. Um, for our Canadian audience today, um, we have another webinar coming up next week, um, Navigating Crisis on Federal Support Programs with um, the Ontario Association of Art Galleries and Young Associates. Um, so that'll be a bit of an overview of the emergency response uh, benefit, the Canadian emergency wage subsidy and talking about how various programs interact with each other. So res um, registration for that webinar is actually gonna be opening right away. So when you leave uh, this one, you can register for that one. Um, I should also let everybody know that we're having our first Museums Connect On um, member check-in tomorrow. We're going to be do the, doing these on Wednesdays at 10 a.m. going forward. Um, first one, we're going to talk a little bit about making the most of your um, OMA member listing while your museum is closed, but then it's also just an opportunity to have an informal chat with your colleagues uh, about whatever happens to be on your mind. Um, so as you know, this webinar was offered free of charge. Um, as a service to the community during what are very difficult times for people personally and professionally. Um, if you're able, these are some things that you can do to help support the OMA to continue to provide um, timely resources. Um, if you are a member already, please renew your membership when you get an email reminder. Um, if you're not a member, consider becoming one. Um, we'd love to have information on our website. Um, or consider making a donation. Any little bit would help. You can do that on our website or through Canada Helps as well. So your support of us and participation in webinars like this is really what makes our uh, sector stronger and we appreciate everything that you contribute. Um, if you go to our website, this is what it looks like on the front page. This is the link to our COVID-19 resources page. So um, we have been, we have a dedicated page specifically for COVID-19 resources. We update it as often as um, new information becomes available. So please do check it out. Um, and uh, new information is, is updated um, on an ongoing basis. So when you leave the webinar, you'll be directed to a very brief three question evaluation. So if you could just take a couple minutes to let us know how we did today um, and let us know what you would like to see more of in the coming weeks, that would be wonderful. So thanks again, Irene. Um, thanks everybody for your participation and uh, have a great day.